Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It is the end of the corporate age. It just pushed me on channel. That was cool. It's a Saturday. <laughs> it's a 420 Saturday. And I know I said like some really depressing things um, uh, two weeks ago. I needed a, a break. I just, I just really needed a sabbatical um, to figure out uh, what I was going to do personally uh, with the climate crisis and what's going on. And um, so we'll talk about that because we got some, I got a lot of stuff going on. We we'll changed the format of the show. Um, wow, 20 people showing up on the back. Good morning, everybody. So you take a week off. There's a lot of people here, um, and uh, we've got the card. That was my. That's my artistic effort to help Joe Biden's campaign. <laughs> um, Amish, you're not centered, my friend. The, <laughs> Here, I'm going to bring everybody into the four shots. We have Marcus and Laura and Amos with us today. Hi, everybody. Good morning, all of y'all. Hi. hi. And hi, everybody. Good morning, hey, America. Brian. What'd you say, Marcus? I said, as usual, good morning, America. Yeah, good morning, America. Happy 420. I've got my joint. Yes. Laura, Laura had hers. Marcus can't show and his I'm in TV. Germany. I'm in Germany. I don't have anything to do with illegal stuff, you know. No, no. Mm -hmm. and, and I think <clears throat> Amos, is it legal for you? Just no, not, not yet. Not, not okay. yet. And you're you're in Jersey or Pennsylvania right now? In Jersey. Jersey. Okay, so it's legal medically, right, but not recreationally. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So. Of course, I'm in California and it's legal. Yay! And Johnson, Oregon, where it's legal. Yay! I'm and in the Disneyland of weed. Yeah. Really. Oh God, no kidding. There's, basically, the dispensaries all over the place, especially where I am in Santa Cruz. So. Yeah. yeah basically. Good times. It's the West Coast. We, they get it. So, yeah, Marcus is going to come out here and see what it's really like because they're too mm -hmm. serious in German. They're just they're all but hashish and climate change. Like, <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. So anyway, we changed the uh, glad you're all here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry about last um, uh, last week um, or the week before. I uh, just <laughs> needed to take some time. And uh, like I said, we'll 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 get into that. Uh, 420. This is what I posted this morning. Um, happy 420, everyone. Remember, there are still people in prison for smoking cannabis. Remember, Joe Biden thinks this is fine, right? And that cannabis is bad. Remember, okay, maybe today is not the best day to remember stuff because we're all going to be high. <laughs> and, but you will in 2020. So yeah. Bernie will win. Legalize it. Puff, puff, pass. Um, that's that's. I like it when I do a tweet and people actually like it. That rarely happens. <laughs> but I like it when that happens. So the, the new format for the show, everybody, is uh, each, each of us gets one story. So that we talk about our one story and we can all talk about it together. And then we've got like some wrap up stuff, you know, what was on last week, what's next week. All the wrap up stuff is, not, is fine. Amos is cleaning his camera. <laughs> <laughs> So it makes this the production that it is, right? Uh, <laughs> highly professional, highly paid production. That, uh, can I? Yeah, exactly. We all get paid a lot of zeros. Can I? I yeah. got complimented on this sweater in Safeway the other day. I just want to tell you. Oh, hey. Right nice. on. Woman walking by me about my age says, I like your sweater. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I need to have you, a better statement. You, it really you, pulls your look together. Thank you. Did she know why she liked it? Did she make? I think she, it's from her look. I could tell she, she knew it was a dude sweater. You know. All right, all right, all right. Cool. And for the and for new viewers, this is the official you know dude sweater from the Big Lebowski. Actually, so. I have a Big Lebowski shirt on too because this kind of went on a kick. Uh, 
So that this is the sweater. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. And this is the uh, abides. Well, I said, you can't even see it there. Yeah. Abide. Abide. Oh, I like that. All right. All right. Very nice. So, yeah. You know, this, I mean, this outfit is the perfect outfit to go to Portland today, right? And to have yeah. fun there. Why would I do that? But on weekday, come on. We take. I'm in Albany, man. I'm I'm down where the growers actually are. Why would yeah. I go to more? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, bigger city, you know, yes. having fun yes. in, the, in the in the clubs and all this stuff, you know. That's what you the do. Shit, the yeah, shit we did like. in Düsseldorf, man. Yes, the stuff you like to do. I live in a box on a farm. Remember that? I don't. I don't go to public stuff. I can I show off? Can I show off my yes. shirt too? Oh, Laura's got yes. a great shirt. Yes. 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 So this is from the our store of Bernie merchandise. This is the Not Me Us uh, shirt. It's the glasses don't show really well on the brown, but uh, we're. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later today. We've got all this cool Bernie merchandise, and there's a 420 discount on the shop today. 20% off oh. with a code that we'll give you later in the show. How's that for a teaser? I had I no, like it's that. very good, Laura. That's nice. Well done. Well done. Uh, so your sweater wrap is your story. Th no, that is not my story. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is extra bullshit that we're this not. This is the monologue at the yes. beginning. This is the monologue at the beginning where we say <laughs> hi to everybody and, and yeah. waste a bunch of time. But now we're going to move right into the serious shit, starting with Amos, who's going to be talking about Climate change. Most of us are talking about climate change today. Laura's going to talk about uh, screwing Bernie in the in the uh, election uh, and and what no, that might no, look like. No, I'm giving the I'm giving the 411 on super delegates as I All learned right. a little bit more about the new rules today. This All week. right, there, there you go. So you're optimistic. You're positive on this. Yes, yes. somebody has to be. God damn it. Yeah, <laughs> Julie Love. I, the dude abides in all of us. Yes, there's a dude in everyone. Yes. All right. So Amos, take it away. I'll get your shot set up. What are we talking about today, sir? Before I launch into that, I want to share something. Uh, Please. On a personal level. Um, let's start from squ square one. So <laughs> this is the bread of affliction, and I'm going to afflict myself with this bread for about a week. I'm not supposed to eat any uh, wheat, so wish me luck. <laughs> oh, oh, you're doing that? It, it, uh, oh, I forget what the... Is it Lent? No. What is it? So, Passover. 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 Yes. Right, 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 right. Right. All right. Well, enjoy that stuff. Thank you. Uh, so uh, today I wanted to cover this Pew Research uh, uh, survey that was done, recent survey, about uh, opinion, global, global and U.S. public opinion uh, on uh, climate change. Uh, and if you want to like up, uh, increase the size of this uh, uh, slide so I can uh, discuss their results. Sure. Hang on a second. Sorry, playing around with your lower third. All right, there you go. So, all right. So here you can see this is uh, relating to the U.S. And you've, you, you can see that over the years it's uh, been going up. I'm not sure why, like... In the last part, it, it dips a little bit, but uh, it's still like all on, on the rise. In 2015, you can see that the uh, blue line breaks. This is the blue line is about climate change and the green line is about just environmental uh, uh, problems altogether. Um, so for some reason, the US public is much more concerned uh, about uh, environmental issues altogether, when you ask them specifically about climate change, uh, their response is much, they're not as concerned about it. Uh, and the, the place where the line breaks, they ask actually asked it in two different ways. They asked it, uh, are you concerned about climate change? And the other way was, are you concerned about, um, uh, about global warming? And the global warming actually received more uh, response than the climate change. So I don't know if we, I don't know if we have to uh, change the uh, the discussion on uh, on it, the framing on it. Perhaps some research needs to be done how to frame it. Uh, it apparently, it, at least psychologically, it has uh, it has an impact of uh, how you how what do you call it. Let's thank MSM for that narrative, mm -hmm. right? 
exactly. And all in all, I, I don't think we're where we're supposed to be. In order to get to where we're supposed to be, the line should be like this. Right now, you can see it's not. Uh, hopefully, we can turn it around and, and we can get this nice ex exponential curve from here. But that's really what it depends on. Um, if you look at the next... Uh, Slide. Okay, so here, here's the, uh, uh, here's the what people considered um, to if whether it has a, a personal effect on them, and you can see that uh, people on the whole had uh, uh, considerably uh, a lot of them thought that at least that two thirds considered that uh, it is something that affects them personally. Uh, which is which is uh, and I think encouraging. Uh, more so, the people on the coast were concerned with uh, with uh, rise of uh, sea level. Uh, when you go 300 miles inwards, uh, that drops. So uh, they've they've seen a considerable drop of uh, concern about that. But uh, people are concerned about fires, about droughts and so on so do you, do you think this report was done before or after nebraska went underwater um i'm i'm not sure of the date on this report but it's uh it's recent uh i, I think uh you know what i mean i mean i'm just saying you know you have to know the date what i'm saying is i wonder if many people in the midwest at this point the bible belt are rethinking their thoughts you know i send them thoughts yeah, i mean more and more people do obviously i mean and that's that's an encouraging uh, result that people are are kind of uh, seeing through this yeah it, it's it, unfortunate it has to happen a disaster right but it is encouraging yeah okay yeah, and the next uh, slide is um um here we see the uh difference between republicans and uh democrats <laughs> and you can see that the, throughout the years the uh the response to climate change has significantly significantly changed for democrats but barely moved uh, for uh, republicans if you look at the red line it started in, at 23 i believe and it's now uh 27 uh barely any movement um where did they get it, their information i wonder well, that is, yeah, that is uh, essentially the problem. Um, and uh, basically, they're not as they're not as concerned. If you look at uh, the the other the other uh, uh, display, um, they're just basically not as concerned with uh, with what's going on. So, um, all right. So, if you want to go to the next one. You know, I'd love to, and it's probably, maybe there's a chart for this, but I'd love to see if they did this based on geographic location, because um, I wonder how many of those people just haven't been directly affected by climate crisis yet, <laughs> you know? Well, I think that, uh, well, that's a good question, but I think uh, uh, conservatives and uh, Democrats uh, were taken probably at the same kind of level to, to even out across across the, their uh, geographic uh, testing, but that's, uh, that's a good question. Good point. Yeah. Uh, so here you can see that there is like a correlation where it comes to education, but only for Democrats, um, the people that have uh, more more knowledge uh, or education have significantly uh, uh, consider significantly uh, more seriously the uh, fact that uh, it's human it's human uh, activity that's causing it. And with the uh, Republicans, surprisingly, that's not the case. They uh, they're pretty much uh, the same, regardless of what level of scientific education you you have. That's uh, education versus indoctrination. Indoctrination wins. As an ex-Catholic, I can tell you that for sure. Yeah, and this is like specifically for scientific uh, education, scientifically uh, ah. related uh, knowledge. Yeah. Well, as long as they have access to that information, we should be okay. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an important point too yeah um and then they looked at uh, i think the next one is is about uh um how it changes across the age group and uh you can see that almost on any any topic the millennials come first then the boomers and then uh and then older uh, then the uh, gen xers and then the boomers 
Um, and uh, so they're the most progressive uh, field uh, politically right now. They remember and the I, account. They now. get it. Um, it. It's it's encouraging because it's going to be more of them, uh, sadly, uh, and less of the older folks uh, as as uh, we go along. And, and that uh, I don't know if it can happen fast enough, but uh, you can see that, uh, that, that this is happening. Um, what happens fast enough that more old people die or that more, <laughs> more of them get it? Well, the, the young guys are getting into the fields to be able to do stuff about it. So. Ah, well, yeah, agreed. Okay. And and now they also looked at uh, international uh, international effects, and you can see uh, the U.S. is kind of in the middle of the pack where it comes to how many people consider it as a serious problem, glo global climate change, as a ser serious problem, uh, as opposed to uh, the number of people who uh, don't think it's as serious or they don't think at all that it, that that uh, that it's uh, happening or whatever. So, um, unfortunately, uh, I'm a little embarrassed. Israel is at the bottom of the that list. Weird. It has to do more with the fact that they're con completely uh, uh, focused on other other political things, um, including cannabis. By the way, it's pointing because <laughs> it's a, it, it, after all, it's a low lying uh, country with a huge coastal region. So, if anybody is going to be affected, it's it's Israel. And you can see the the other parts of the graph show the also the movement of uh, public opinion in the world, in different countries as as it goes uh, from year to year across the years, and and almost in all, except for that little dip in in uh, the, the bottom one, almost um, all of them are going up. So so that's encouraging too. Yeah, what's up with Poland, in the dip? Well, I that I'm not sure. I don't know, but they don't have a completely democratic uh, government there, and I think that has to do with it, what's being shown and what's being shared, yeah. information. As as is the case with Hungary and Russia. Russia is also very badly uh, affected. They they believe that it's a hoax. Wow, that's unfortunate. But you think overall in the U.S. this is a positive? Overall in the world? Well, we're we're kind of in the middle there, so uh, I think there's a lot of space for improvement. All right. All right. Well, thank you on that. And before we move on to your next, uh, it looks like you have a little thing in here about Bernie. Mm -hmm. Next slide. But I just want to say thank you, Jim Lockett, for your five dollar donation, and stop it with your nuclear power nonsense. All right. Back to you. Yeah, so um, I don't know if you wanted to play the Bernie uh, clip now or, or uh, at a later point. Well, why are we running a Bernie clip? What does that have to do with this? It, it does not have to do with this. It's uh, about health clip. Medicare for all. Oh, well, that's a different story. It's <laughs> a different story. <laughs> I was wondering what the... Okay, we might run it later on just because it's cool because it talks about healthcare for all, but that's a different story. You, I just want to show this poll. You've got the slide in here for this uh, Bernie leading among Hispanic voters, right? That's you? Drop this in here? That was from last week's. That's from last week? Oh, I didn't delete it. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank you, Amos. Appreciate that. Um, I'm kind of... I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to be excited about those results or what. They're, like you said, it, it should be, right? <laughs> if we're gonna if we're gonna survive, we need to see those graphs go up a lot steeper. I think that's oh. it, mm -hmm. We have to count on the uh, extension uh, rebellion and uh, sunrise movement. It's an interesting statement. Yes. And I'm going to yes. talk about that. That's an interesting statement. So. All right, salt thorium, not uranium. I heard about that, but I saw something else that said that was just as bad. So I don't know. We looked at that for a while. I was talking about nuclear reactors again. You know that. All right. So, what are you guys? What was going on in the chat, Laura? You're, you were looking at chat. No, I wasn't. About? I was making my my. Just <laughs> <laughs> I was in there a little bit. There we just saying hi. All right. 
All right. Well, it looks like you guys are having a good conversation. We got 52 people watching right now live. Thank wow. you for being here. Nice. That's a lot. Thank you. Um, uh, it's like I said, it's a new format. Amos just did his little his piece on uh, climate change and the reporting of polling, which mm, I don't know. The United States really needs to pick up its shit there. But uh, thank you for that, Amos. Laura, yes, it's your turn. Okay, so I was all set to report on the uh, the whole cap thing with the New York Times article about Neera Tandon and how she had punched the her editor from uh, Think Progress during an interview with Hillary because he asked her a question about Iraq. I thought it was really interesting that uh, um, the person she punched at exact is actually uh, now Bernie's campaign manager. So that was going to be my story, but then. Um, that was Monday, and then by the end of the week, I learned something new that I wanted to share. So there was an article um, that posted earlier in the week in, in Grit Post. Uh, the headline was, DNC bosses contemplating a superdelegate coup if Bernie Sanders leads in delegates. And that's a huge fear that we've had, right, as progressives, because um, the, the field is so stacked right now. And for Bernie to be the nominee, he needs to get 50% plus one of the pledged delegates. If he does that, you know, so the, so the short answer to all of this is if he does that, uh, then superdelegates don't come into the equation. But this article says, you know, by design, the superdelegate system is there to give a boost to the establishment's favored candidates. Well, it, it certainly was when they were all pledged ahead of time for Hillary in 2016. And that that's not the case now with anybody. Um, but they said in the, but they went on to say that Senator Debbie Stabenow, who is we're not a big fan of, um, who is a DNC super delegate, uh, admitted that uh, while reluctant to do so, she may use her vote to, to kneecap Sanders in the second ballot. So they you know so they state that in the article, but then the, her actual quote was, um, you know, should no bargain be struck by the time of the first roll call vote, you know, then the superdelegates would come in. But she's saying, you know, we don't really want, she says, we don't really want to do that. If we have a role, so be it. But I'd much prefer that it be decided in the first round just from a unity standpoint. So she's not saying she's going to kneecap him. She's saying she would rather be, you know, that it rather be decided in the first round. So so that laid the, this whole, you know, like, fear-mongering question. So Don Ford, who is a... Uh, um, Work, has been working very hard on superdelegate reform since 2016, going to all the DNC meetings and really lobbying for to reform the system, helped to put together the new program which is in place, which is superdelegates don't you know, come into play until the second round of voting at the, um, during the primary. So if you go to the next slide, um, slide 15. So I, it's a very long article. There's a link. It's a, it's a Facebook post, public Facebook post. There's a link in the description. That you can go through the whole thing. He gives a big backstory. But I just wanted to hit his top three points and then kind of his conclusion here is just to give you guys a little bit of um, information to frame your understanding of superdelegates around. And you may find out something different. And I'm sure that there's uh, they're trying to, to get around this as much as they can. But the number one thing is superdelegates as they were defined before, no longer exist. That was an informal term used to describe an unpledged delegate. And they were called superdelegates because they were both were unpledged on the first ballot and automatically were going to the convention. So these are all those votes that they kept tacking on to Hillary's delegate counts during the primaries because they were all, there's you know, hundreds of them already pledged to her before the primaries even started it was just it was all just you know locked and loaded that's why she was so cocky because she had them already in her pocket um so the the uh, reform to the process was they've been removed from the first ballot they cannot pledge ahead of time they cannot be counted for anybody until it, unless it goes to a second vote in the at the convention um they have become automatic delegates because the way the convention rules are set up, the party leadership needs to be making decisions about how the convention will be organized before the pledge delegates are even chosen. So this is what Donna Brazil meant when she said, you know, setting the menu during the during the convention. So that's his number one point. So superdelegates, as we saw them before, do not exist. So be careful when you, if you still think that that's what's going on. Um, and two, the rule for this was passed within the convention, within in the convention rules. So it can't be changed 
um, unless they reopen the rules for the convention. So this can only be done last summer or when this is all decided or when the convention opens. Um, so yes, there are. there is rumor of, or perhaps even not even rumor, of plans to attempt to reopen the rules at the convention and get, and get that reinstated for them to be in the first round so that they can come in at the 11th hour. But his point is, and this is what caught my eye when I first read this, the point that this can be out-organized. This is why organizing now, and we'll get into the upcoming uh, things going on with Bernie at my next segment. But at the end of the primary, the party secretary will determine if there is a winner. If Bernie is ahead enough at this point that there is, that there, then there will be no changing of the rules that could, that could alter the outcome. They're not allowed to change a rule like this if it will drastically alter the outcome. So I thought that was encouraging. And then number three, the winner is whoever reaches 50% plus one of the pledged delegates by the end of the primary. So this was a huge win. Last time the first ballot you know, win included the superdelegates, which was, this has allowed them to be added to the total to win you know, during the convention and why the media was able to stack it and spin it uh, the way they did. I see. Okay, so but so we've got clear math. We have got such clear math. We have, we know we need to get fifty one percent of pledged delegates. That is what the focus should be on. Uh, it is, empowers the uh, grassroots campaign, and it hasn't been ever been like this since the creation of unpledged delegates um, started. So one more slide that kind of has some of the you know, kind of what that. Uh, breaks down to Bernie received 47 percent of the pledged delegates last time 47 percent they don't want this number matters because the DNC tried to hide it with the cluttering with the numbers with the super delegates so it right. seemed like it was a blowout right no 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 47 percent um and we saw this happening we were like wait you know and they're like popular vote and Trump and whatever it was all completely hidden uh and many and many people you know still believe that it was a blowout and this will be very surprising um, in 2016, no one hit the total to win because the math was so messed up. And this was uh, fixed when they changed it to the 50 cent plus one of eligible delegates and only pledged delegates are eligible on the first ballot. No extra things. So, and a couple other little just side bits on that. There is a 15% requirement to get any delegates at all. So this is where the whole, our big, you know, right. 20 million people running um, shoots them all in the foot and in the... I'm, I've got some notes here. In the national delegate math itself, there's a requirement that you have to have 15% of the popular vote in the state to get any delegates there. So watering down the primary with lots of candidates and splitting up support is not going to lead to a brokered convention. I thought that was really an interesting thing to focus on as well. And it will lead to most candidates not getting any delegates. And if you look at the polling, very few are above 15%. Wow. And most candidates will leave the race after Iowa and New Hampshire. This is going to be a very much cleaned out race after the first couple of primaries at the beginning of next year. Because uh, when you don't get any delegates in the first two races, then it's pretty much over for your fundraising. <laughs> Everybody's going to bail on you. And it makes it extremely challenging to keep moving without going back on many of your campaign promises, including accepting money from questionable sources. So... Wow. Anyway, I just thought that was, a, a you know, whether it's controversial or not, or if there's other ways that you can interpret these things, but this is a guy who was very instrumental in putting this into place. So I, I, I believe he is a trustworthy source, and I would love to have him on the show. I know Larry is doing very much similar things in Oregon. It'd be great for them to have a, a conversation about this. Yeah. I think it's I, I'm yeah I would really like to I've seen Don post a lot of this stuff in Facebook and if Don mm -hmm. happens to watch this which is doubtful but if you do hey Don we'd love to have you on and I'd like to connect you with Larry as Laura said because Larry is a registered parliamentarian he's been dissecting the DNC bylaws mm -hmm. uh, if they are planning some kind of, of bullshit on the first day um, that is interesting because mm -hmm. we were planning something on the first day as well to make some motions and bylaws changes mm -hmm. and uh, this is good information to know because uh, other people in the progressive movement are like oh let's not even bother mm -hmm. with that a floor fight let's not even touch it but they're preparing for one so it would be yeah. naive and I say this to Norman Solomon with Roots Action it would be naive of us not to prepare for a floor action all right um, you know, let's let's we're in we're at a war here for our lives, and and this is uh, some solid information. 
it's mm-hmm. um, it's positive information, surprisingly. Yeah, well, that's why I liked it. And so I, I took the opportunity just to segue on that uh, slide 19. Nice. It's in Saturday. So speak, So he says, you know, we can out-organize this. The, the power that we have is the number of people that are behind Bernie's campaign, way more than anybody else does. You don't find people, you know, pledging to work their hearts out for Joe Biden. So... Um, <laughs> Anyway, so uh, this was an article that was in Politico. Uh, Sanders' campaign organizes nearly 4,000 parties by April 27th. What I, I like, really liked Faye's uh, Shakir's quote here: uh, "People power is the unique and comparative advantages of the Bernie advantage of the Bernie Sanders campaign," said Faye Shakir. And so remember, this is the one who got punched by Neera Tandon. Oh, this is the dude that got punched. Oh, okay. Yes, that's that's the whole thing. So he's got someone there who is really uh, savvy with the. Um, the workings of the other side, much more so it than many, last time. many people. It says, it says, we are seeing an extraordinary mass participation from a dedicated volunteer base whose individual skills, life experiences, and relationships to their communities allows us to connect with voters in a way that hasn't been done before. This is how you out organize. You know, DNC is not a monolith and it's not all powerful anymore. They don't have the money. They aren't focused. They don't have Hillary Clinton. They've got Tom Perez. They don't even have Debbie Wasserman Schultz anymore. It's, uh, it, yeah. So the, oh, so the map. So this is uh, next Saturday is the organizing um, for Bernie uh, parties, the organizing parties all over the Just country, all the way down to Puerto Rico. And there's some up in Alaska, but. The slide fit better this way. Sorry, Alaska. Um, <laughs> I'm going to one here in Santa Cruz, and it's really interesting because most of my connection, whether other burners, has been completely digital, virtual through, you know, YouTube and social media. You know, I've yeah, I've met I've met John a few times, but it'd be really nice to actually meet live people in my own community that are burners, and I fully expect to uh, get involved with them, and hopefully, you know, we can help them with you know doing little video clips and shit like that. You know, so um, I encourage everybody to you know, click on the. There's a link in the description. If there isn't yet, there will be. Oh, the the show. You know, I forgot to um, drop all of the links in there. I got to do that. We, well, we'll do it it's, if you're watching this later on. But anyway, you put just, you know, Google it, gang. Uh, Bernie's uh, April 27th uh, parties and you just click on this map and you zoom in and you can click on the one nearest your house and find out where it is. And they'll I'm sure there'll be cookies. <laughs> Always cookies. Awesome. So that's so that. Oh, and then one more, one more thing. Oh yeah. These aren't usually stories, so I just tagged them on. But this is important. This is the teaser. This is our Bernie merch. We got some really cool Bernie everything. You know, dog bandanas to t-shirts to the hoodies and everything. Um, and today, actually, for the next couple of days, there's a code. If you go, there's a link. Be a link in the description. Of this as well. There's a twenty percent off everything. Um, sale going on for the next day or two for this weekend or 20 and it's aprl 20 is the code so if you go to the link buy yourself a t-shirt you get um 20 20 percent off and where do they have to go there's a oh i'll drop a link in the chat but there's a link in the description well for, the, be, for our uh, store this seconds. is for our merchandise store that normally just has bernie uh, Hill media logo wear but uh thanks to uh maliki uh, hank's fingers on twitter uh, our new volunteer and you know some you know fancy footwork with uh, john on our website we quickly got up some uh, new bernie wear and i'm sure we will be adding to this as the primary goes on yeah I, I have a quick question for uh, Laura. Hmm. I don't know if you know that, but what happens if, uh, let's say, Biden starts and drops out? What happens with the super delegates? There aren't any super delegates. If Jeff Darden, no delegates are even or will be even assigned um, until until the, the second start. I mean, they got to start. Well, they win. You win delegates with the primaries. You win each primary. You get a certain amount. You added right. it up. So and, if so, what he's saying is, if he gets a bunch of delegates and prim- yeah oh and oh comes out of the oh, primary. If he, oh if we if we get that far into the primary season and then he drops out yeah oh uh, i don't know what that's happens a good question the delegates they go unpledged again they have to pick somebody else that's weird we got to find that out that's a good question i can't imagine him dropping out if he's won a bunch so he he he, ne- he his history with winning delegates during presidential primaries has been dismal. Yeah, but think, his, yeah, yeah well, one or two percent. So I don't think there's going to, uh, yeah, if he, if he drops out, it's because he don't, doesn't have much. So I don't know that would make a huge difference. 
Interesting. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, this is a good time to talk about this. Amos, you wanted to do a bet, right? Uh, sorry? You wanted to do a bet on this, right? Yes, I do. I, I, I think we should do a bet. I would put my, I told uh, John I'd put my money on the fact that he is going to run uh, just for the mere fact that I can't lose. If he uh, pulls out, I'd be happy and I wouldn't mind paying the the uh, debt. And mm -hmm. uh, if, if he doesn't, at least I get some pocket money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll have a pool. We we'll have to have a pool. That, you know, we have to choose our, the date that he will drop out by. But I can't see him. I don't know. I mean, it's like you, you kind of kind of get to the primaries before anybody should drop out, unless he has, unless there's some, you know, the straw polls just slaughter him or something. But he'll be propped up by mainstream long enough to get to the primaries. But whether he does well there is another thing. He's a gaff machine. Oh, Something's going to come out. He's going to kill himself yeah. before we, get, we yeah. get too far, in my view. Yeah, and he's not taking any of Bernie's supporters, gang. Not a one no. is going to go from Bernie to Biden. He might have Buttigieg going to him or Kamala or Corey or someone, but you're not going to dent him. He's Bernie's got his own lane at this point, and the rest of it is just a big shit show. Yeah, you know, but, but, wrangling. But, but I think wait what the mainstream media makes out of it, you know? Oh, yeah. They will push him so heavily, you know, and... Uh, yeah. yeah, because all others don't have a real chance, you know. If we look at the ratings for Kamala Harris, for Beto O'Rourke. Ah, all, okay, you know, you know what? You know what it's going to be? It's going to be the debates, which start in June. That's oh. really going to, that will, that will make a difference. Because if he tanks in the debates uh, badly, you know, then they, then they do polling based on the dates, then that, that could do it earlier than the primaries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's not bad in debates, though. But I, and and uh, I think Beto is more likely to bomb on them. <laughs> oh yeah, I think they think uh, a lot of them. Well, I guess Beto has qualified for the debate stage. He has enough donors. Oh, I gotta find it. <laughs> or, or so we assume the creative accounting, which we all called the, the, when he had, was silent all the weekend after he announced, you know, came to, came to be. He did not beat Bernie on first day fundraising. No, not quite. Oops. Biden Gee. not taking break. What a no. surprise. What a nice chat you guys are having, by the way. I was looking for comments to mention. You guys just. No, they're talking about this. They're not paying attention. No, they're talking about close That's primaries okay. and this stuff. That's, I, I don't. I just don't see Biden surviving. I don't. No. I, I just don't. He but, never has before. And he's in a weaker position than he ever was before. And Bernie's kicking ass. You know, if Biden goes on Fox. Oh, my gosh. You know, what will happen then? Oh. So we're hearing from uh, Melissa H says the delegates can cast their votes for whoever they want if their candidate drops out. So oh, okay. if he Oh, yeah, that's right, because they don't really cast the vote. They pledge it when the delegates pledge during the primary, but they it all has to be them going to the convention and, and formally pledging those at the convention. So right. it's the people at the convention are the only ones who are eligible to get. That makes sense. Right. Who they'll throw it to in a in a you know a guest count will be a different thing, and I'm sure we'll see lots of students on that. Right. Shit right. <laughs> Booted. Yeah, everybody with the names. I was telling I was telling Lori about this last night. Says, you know, there's a guy running for president, and he's got butt in his name, and we're totally not leaving that. Like <laughs> everybody's saying, like attacking. <laughs> like it's, she's like, well, you have no choice. I'm like, I know. I'm like, what do you do? Yeah. But yeah. judge, I think, is what uh, uh, Pat the Burner is using. <laughs> it's just, it's fun. We have to. Yeah. This thing is fun. Thank you for that, Laura. That is a, that is hopeful news. Yeah. Uh, well, like you're welcome. I know parts. you're going to go into despair now or something like that. So I thought, yeah, I had, we're, we're going to. We're everybody's gonna, good news in the middle. We have a little sandwich here. What would the Saturday show be without a little despair? Right? <laughs> That's right. Yes. Look, Marcus will bring us out of that. Marcus yeah. will bring okay. us out of that with, with rebellion. Oh, good. All right. All right. With action, basically. That's that's what it is, with action. And that's from, from Shahid Buttar, because he kind of answered that question weird to me. Uh, the reason I just, like, fell off the face of the earth two weeks ago is because I've just been really fucking depressed. And it's kind of hard not to be when you look at the state of the U.S. and then you look at the world and you look at how many people are dying every day from whatever cause. And you, you think of I'm one of those persons that thinks a lot. Right. I don't go anywhere. I don't like being out in public. So I spend most of my time on my farm farming and thinking. Right. Or sitting in this box, which this is my box of doom. Because every time I come in here on my screens is basically what's going on in the world. And other than the few beans of light that we have, it's pretty much a shit show. Right. 
we have governments around the world fighting the populace to survive. That's, a, that's depressing. It's really fucking depressing. You can't, you can't not be depressed about that. Add to that the fact that I have mental health issues and include really big highs and really big lows. And the problem is I'm, I'm used to doing that, experiencing really big highs and really big lows and managing that and, and, and dealing with that. And I, get, I can have this fun burst of creative energy when I'm on a manic phase and I can just do nothing and eat a lot when I'm on a depressive phase. But when you're constantly depressed and in despair because your planet is dying and your species is dying and the leaders of your species have their heads in their fucking ass and you're trying desperately to get them to fucking do something... Um, those highs don't, this is where manic depression comes in. I got all this energy, but I don't care because I'm depressed as fuck, right? And this, this leads to, this is a deeper kind of fucked up depression that's just not good for anybody. And I guarantee you that I am not alone, <laughs> all right? I know I'm not alone. I'm not unique in this. <laughs> right? This guy wrote an article, though, that kind of smacked me in the face, and he did it with my Catholic guilt, asshole. He says, only rebellion will prevent an ecological apocalypse, which is true. And he says, no one is coming to save us. Mass civil disobedience is essential to force a political response. I'm going to read a lot of what he says because it's just much better than anything I would say. And this year for me is the year about saying less, doing more. All right. So just some of the pieces. Had we put as much effort into preventing environmental catastrophe as we spent on making excuses for inaction, we would probably have solved it by now, which is very true. We can thank capitalism. We can thank consumerism, we can thank our government, we can thank Exxon for that, and the narrative spewed out of our mainstream media. Um, as the environmental crisis accelerates and protest movements like Youth Strike for Climate and Extinction Rebellion make it, hard, make it harder not to see what we face, people discover more incentive means of shutting their eyes and shedding responsibility. And I've been doing this as well. I've been closing myself off from the fucking world. It's like, we're all going to die. I'm just going to prep my little piece of land, take care of the plants and animals, feel good about that, and wait to die. That's really, really where I'm at, right? Because I don't have faith in our government. Neither does this guy. <laughs> Those who govern the nation and shape public discourse cannot be trusted with the preservation of life on Earth. That is about the scariest, most accurate statement there is. Those who govern the nation and shape public discourse cannot be trusted with the preservation of life on earth. And that should scare the living fuck out of everybody and keep you awake at night and make people like Greta Thunberg cry, which it does. <laughs> and it makes me despair and depressed and paralyzed, you know, because this is fucking true. And voting hasn't done so much so far. Being angry hasn't done so much so far. Being out in the fucking streets hasn't done so much so far. Having children speak directly to our fallen fucking politicians has gotten them insults. Patriot, patriotism claps, right? When Dianne Feinstein tells a group of kids, I've been doing this for 30 years. I just want to shove her head on a spike. Yeah, and you failed. You fucking failed, you old bitch. And now you're telling these kids that they didn't vote for you? You're fucking insane. You're out of your fucking mind. These old people that run our government are so disconnected from reality. And that's, that makes me not only dis in despair, but enraged. Right? And I don't know what to do with that energy either. Right? What do I do with this rage and despair and depression? Right? There is no benign authority preserving, uh, preserving us from harm. No one is coming to save us, not Jesus, not aliens, no one, but us, not the kids. I hear everybody's, ah, oh, the kids are going to save us. No, you have to get off your ass too. The kids are asking you, the old fucking people, to get off your ass, pull your heads out and do something. Me, <laughs> the guy who doesn't want to leave his box, you know, the kids aren't saying we're here to save you. The kids are like, what the fuck are you doing? That's what the kids are saying. We're kids. Grow the fuck up. <laughs> you know? It, none of us can justifiably avoid the call to come together to save ourselves. Yet we have, as we saw Amos' polls, <laughs> we're not all together on that. 
Not even the mainstream media propagandists that for some reason think they're going to survive this. Where do they think they're going to go that a billion enraged starving people aren't going to fight them and eat them? Eat the rich is not a joke. It's not a joke. When our fisheries collapse in a few decades, um, eat the rich is going to be a very viable uh, thought, right? Did I skip one? Hang on. No. So, this guy goes into what despair is. I see despair as another variety of disavowal. And that's what I've been doing. By throwing up our hands about the calamities that could one day afflict us, we disguise and distance them, converting concrete choices into indecipherable dread. We might relieve ourselves of moral agency by claiming that it's already too late to act. We know it's too late to act. We know it's too late to stop what's happening right now. Climate crisis happening right now. People dying all over the fucking world right now. Animals dying all over the world. How many cows drowned in Nebraska and Iowa and, and everything that just happened in the flooding? Right? I mean, and that's, that's the climate crisis happening right now. And those of us who look at it every day, like I do, like Laura does, and Marcus does, and Amos does, and everybody in the audience, we all look at this shit every day where it's on social media. But the people that watch MSM, they don't get this. They're shielded from this, right? So they have it a lot easier. Oh, climate isn't affecting me. We saw that in the polls. It's not affecting me directly. Eh, whatever. I'm not so sure. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. Until it annihilates my part of land. You know? This is where he gets sort of positive. And this is where I'm on the fence. But this is where XR comes in. This is where action comes in. Where Shahid Buttar told me, you know, action and community are the two ways to get out of despair. Well, I'm not a big fan of community, but I can do action. I mean, I like community. I just don't want to be in it. You know what I mean? So this is where this guy talks about historically what it's going to take to make the transformation. And this is where I'm on the fence. Every nonlinear transformation in history has taken people by surprise. As some guy explains in his book about the collapse of the Soviet Union, systems look immutable until they suddenly disintegrate. Now, I know that somebody else, Andrew uh, Goldstein, uh, is it Goldstein? Uh, anyway, I interviewed a guy a while ago about Africa, South Africa, and in six years, they basically did 180 degrees. Now, they're back the other way again, but at that point in time, they'd made a great change, and it took them about six years. We have maybe six years to do the same, right? And I think we're facing a greater problem than South Africa faced, honestly, in my view. Um, our system, characterized by perpetual economic growth on a planet that is not growing, will eventually implode. This is the collapse we're talking about, the collapse of our food systems, the collapse of our monetary systems, right? All these things that have been propped up by capitalism that really don't have anything underneath them, right? We've been gutting our earth and gutting it and gutting it, and the, the, the ocean is not going to sustain this. Our lands are not going to sustain us anymore. We're, we're headed towards that. We can't stop that. We can't stop that. Um, th th this, is, this is where it gets our only question is whether the transformation that we have to make <laughs> is planned or unplanned our task is to ensure that it's planned and fast right? government has no they don't want to do either they don't want to plan it and they don't want to do it at all we have to change that we need to conceive and build a new system based on the principle that every generation everywhere has an equal right to enjoy natural wealth that's supposedly written into the Constitution, I believe, but it's been misinterpreted. This is less daunting than we might imagine. Research says that for a mass movement, a peaceful mass movement to succeed, 3.5% of the population needs to mobilize. I have no idea what number that is, but obviously we're not even fucking close. All right. Do you guys think we can get to 3.5% of peaceful population protest? And does anybody think peaceful protest in a country with the largest military, most violent military in the history of humankind is going to be peacefully okay with not doing what it does anymore. I just, I don't know about that. But this guy seems to think it's going to work. Today, Extinction Rebellion takes to the streets around the world in defense of our life support systems. Through daring, disruptive, nonviolent action, it forces our environmental predicament uh, onto the political agenda. Uh, you know, who are these people? They're us. 
right? Marcus joined Extinction Rebellion. I reached out to Extinction Rebellion and said I would like to, you know, provide media support to you. So, um, I, I, we, we've been looking for a, a focal point, something to harness, and I think the yellow vest was like kind of the, an interesting start to that. I think Extinction Rebellion could become uh, uh, what really, uh, what we unify around, and I, and I hope that we do. All right. Um, I will fight every day to not be in despair and not be paralyzed. And right now, this week, this day, things are pretty good, right? I feel good about what's going on. I feel good about things that have happened recently that I think are going to eventually make some change in California or maybe help out a candidate or some change in Oregon and, and the stuff that we're doing here. Uh, right now, I feel okay and good about it, but that doesn't mean in 48 hours... I won't have seen something that just devastates me in terms of the, the planet and, and, and our environment, and, and I'll feel differently. And, and we, all have to, we all have to accept that, that we're going to have these highs and lows about how we feel about the revolution. And this is just something that's it's part of what batters you in the war. And yeah, I realize that here I am, Mr. Privileged Guy, sitting in my nice fucking place talking about this stuff, and it's all mental stuff. All right, and that there's kids in cages and there's people on the streets and there's people actually dying and shit. And so comparatively, it's like, yeah, whatever, dude. All right. But we all fight our own battles in our own way. And this is mine. All right. To not be so depressed, to not be so in despair that I can remain useful to the revolution. All right. And so I want to thank George Monbiot and uh, Shahid Buttar or kind of smacking me around. I can't even find a quote in here, but the one that, that really hit me in this article, which is somewhere on one of these pages. Ah, here it goes. Giving up before we have reached the threshold of 3, three to 5%, 3.5%, uh, is worse than despair. It is defeatism. And then he says in here, uh, I agree with the Christians that despair is a sin. And so that just like nailed me with my Catholic, oh, I'm sinning. Fucking me. What am I doing? And it... <sighs> I don't really believe in the concept of sins, but I do believe in the idea of um, not being useful or just not really, if you're not going to be effective, then what are you doing, right? So, okay, um, be useful. Find a way to get over my despair and be useful. And so I took some action this last couple of days on that, reached out to some people so that I could do things that I felt good about, and that's why we're here. So, uh, I just, so for all of you guys... That's what I'm trying to say. If you're in despair, if you're feeling shitty about stuff, action and community. Reach out or go fucking do something. Right? I spent three days doing nothing but my yard. It's like, I don't want to give a fuck about anything but my yard just so I can feel like I've cared for something and it mattered. Right? And then that was healing and then we moved on. Right? So that's my piece. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much, John. This was, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You're right, We're going to do stuff that feels fun and useful yeah. with, the, the, with the station. You know, we, you know, we're not going to try and pack our schedule with We the People interviews back to back to back with people that right. that are difficult to work with or that we can, <laughs> or just, or just doing it just to do it. You know, we just, we are going to pick and choose the projects that we want to do and the people that we want to help and, and focus on people that come to us, you know? Yeah. We've reached out to make, to, to make a couple of things happen and we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cam, we're going to have Shahid Buttar back on for a special event to talk about mm -hmm. the Mueller report and the need to impeach because he believes uh, that we should. And, and he's a constitutional lawyer. So I think that should be a, mm -hmm. a pretty informed conversation. Right. Um, yeah. And we're trying to make something else happen that I don't even want to talk about right now because I feel like it would jinx it if I did. So <laughs> uh, we'll see if just stay tuned. We'll see Subscribe, if that happens. Get yeah. notifications. You'll find out. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to try to do stuff that that is useful, but different and kind of fits our style. Like Laura said, it's, it's not mm -hmm. trying to do all these big interviews. Mm -hmm. It's not really our thing. You know, hanging out with you guys. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, all right. 
And a nice conversation you guys are having. All 44 of you that are still with us today. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So your depression is a uh, tactic 101 of fascism. Yeah, Phil. It probably is. Marcus, it's your turn. Yeah. Thank you, John. And, uh, well, it was um, what you said. I can I can feel like you can feel because, uh, uh, in part, I felt the same. You know, it it is not the roller coaster ride like you are suffering. You know, with up and ups and downs. But uh, in contrary for me, it was another thing in, in the past year. It was a constant, if you want to call it, a, 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 sit, um, a situation of, of paralyzation, you know. So I could not move at all, you know. And uh, yeah. a lot of things happened in my life in the, in the, in the past couple of months. And uh, uh, this, this also drew me to some, uh, this drew me to make some decisions. And um, one of them was to quit my job uh, to... Uh, to uh, change my life and um, one one of the thing is I can go back uh, to summer last year you know which um, which was a very dramatic summer we had here in Germany and um, if uh, we talked about this if you remember that our river Rhine which is one of the biggest uh, rivers in, in Europe uh, lost half of its water content you know it was only a little a little river you know and uh, people start to grow tomatoes at the at the banks of this new little river you know and uh, it was it was a very dramatic situation which um, which made the people aware that something is not working right here you know more and more people awoke on what's going on here and um, well and I, I decided for myself you know that I don't want to go on like I did in the past you know that I want to be active that I want to become active to do something against against what is happening to us um i know it's it's a fight it's, it's a lost fight in the end because i don't have a lot of trust that anything would change but at least i would i would have tried something you know and uh, this led me um to join also the uh, ex rebellion as uh, john said before and uh, what's interesting is um coming back to last year that uh, in this situation in this hot summer with all those environmental uh, influences it helped a lot the green party here in germany they got so much support the ratings increased and uh, yeah and all the other uh, parties in germany they started to look at them and see and saw okay maybe the climate change is a topic we might use for our purposes you know? and uh, um, this um, this clearly came out now with the uh, rising protests of the students here in Germany as well in the in the uh, Friday for Future movement and uh, it was deeply criticized of course by the uh, by the market liberals here by the party F FDP you know and uh, their uh, their boss is Christian Lindner we talked about him in the past uh, shows already and um, yeah he brought in a statement which is uh, you know the, exactly the point uh, that those politicians did not understand anything. But it's a clear point. It's a clear statement. He said, uh, one, uh, uh, I translated one, uh, one quote of it, you cannot expect kids are able to understand the global connection and what is in economically possible, you know. And this, you know, he's talking about economy in this, um, in this contest when it, when it is about our lives, about the future of our children, etc. You know, and this shows clearly. Okay, this this guy has his point, you know, but he gets deeply criticized meanwhile by its own party who says, okay, we cannot present ourselves anymore like the party of those who are better earning and uh, that we are heartless and we don't have any empathy for people or for the situation. We must, uh, yeah, we must uh, try to change us or at least um, give the attempt uh, uh, or the, the, the color that we are carrying, you know. And uh, this is the, the complete hypocrisy, you know, we are seeing here. And uh, also we have our Bundes Chancellor Angela Merkel, who is telling kids who are protesting it, it is a real quote of her it's right you raise the pressure on us i mean guys this is our bundes chancellor and she and 
in the end, she doesn't give a shit about what's going on. They all don't, you know, but they all want to be somehow connected with, uh, with climate change, that they are doing something, and they're coming up with stupid ideas. Christian Lindner, for example, in a discussion show, he clearly said um, what he's expecting. He says, we don't wait what the future, we don't know what the future offers. Maybe the technology, the technological progress will be so far that one day we have the solution for all of this. This, this tells us in Germany a politician, right? Yeah. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. And this shows they understood absolutely nothing. But all want to be, they have the color of being uh, uh, someone who is doing something, who, are, who is on the side of those, of those who are protesting, you know. Lindner not is a statement. He's an asshole. I'm sorry to say this, but he is one. Uh, anyway, um, but why I say uh, that the climate crisis is the next big coming thing, you know, I think we are seeing this in the U.S., you know, um, with the, the Medicare for all discussions, you know. We see, for example, Nancy Pelosi in an interview saying, you know, that there are only of like five people, you know, the progressive left uh, wing of the party. And, you know, being asked uh, if she considers herself being a progressive, she says yes. It's the same thing, you know. They're trying to board the, the, the issue, the topics, you know, and the normal voter. This is what, what I see, you know. The normal voter in the U.S. might not understand, you know, that there is a progressive like AOC who is coming up with stuff, you know. And on the other side, there is Nancy Pelosi who describes herself also being progressive. This is a big, big, uh, uh, this is not grabbable for, for those voters, I think. And I think this is intended. This is only to bring brainwash people, you know, everything should be the same and nothing should be changed, but all want to have, uh, want to have uh, the, the color of, of being progressive, you know, it is the same thing we are seeing, we are seeing in Germany with uh, the climate crisis, you know, and this is uh, such a bigotry and a hypocrisy, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't, I really don't, don't grab it that those politicians are so stupid or think that we are so stupid that we don't understand what's going on. Yeah, and leading over now uh, to a, an impressive article, which is in the international version of the Spiegel online. The link is under the video, um, in which uh, the author I gotta open it here for myself. That was bigger, uh, Christian Stöcker. He says clearly he is absolutely on the side of of the protesters. He says they are not even angry enough, you know, because the generations who are coming. This is not only one; there are several generations. They are absolutely betrayed by us, you know, not only by us, by all the generations before who did not uh, took care when they knew about what, what, what is threatening us, you know. And um, he goes on in his article, you know, um, in Germany, it's the situation he describes being in discussions, uh, he says, but Professor so-and-so said the debate around uh, whether mankind is to blame for climate change is over. There's global consensus. The only people who refuse to get on board are Donald Trump and far-right populists like Germany's Beatrix von Storch of the Alternative for Germany, our AFD party. For years, countless lies were told and people were deliberately misled about the climate by people on the payroll of the very industries that make their shareholders rich with fossil fuels. And this is an absolute fact. And, uh, you know, and um, the, the discussion goes on, you know, when, when you talk with people and it's very difficult in, in Germany and um, it is always the same arguments. It won't be so bad. It will happen only in, only in Africa or Asia, but not over here. And then again, the, the Lindner quote, you know, they will find some kind of technology solutions in time. In time, yes. We can pray for this, you know. Thoughts and prayers. Fucking bullshit. I'm sorry to say the word fuck for today for the first time. You know? Really? And that was the first fuck? Uh, I, I, think, I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. You know, well, thank and, you. and it goes on, it goes on, you know. Oh, but other countries are doing nothing. Why should we, you know? It is the same lame excuse, you know, which will bring us, yeah, which will bring us down, you know. And uh, to, uh, uh, to finalize this, to close this, uh, I quote this, there are currently a lot of vivid examples of older people consciously making decisions against the interests of the younger generation out of dogmatism, greed, or recklessness, a mixture of all three. But it's becoming increasingly clear that this betrayed generation won't allow this to go on for much longer. 
that they will use their deep knowledge of the digital uh, digital public sphere for their own purposes. And the examples are already there. U.S. gun laws, EU, EU copyright law reform, Brexit and climate policy. The young have started fighting back and they shouldn't stop. And this is exactly the point. We should not discuss about skipping school and bullshit. In Germany, they're threatening those um, with, with legal fines, you know, we're skipping uh, the, um, the school on Fridays, you know. They're, they're building now crowdfunding, you know, to help those students, you know, if they got to pay something, you know. But this shows exactly the oppression, you know. They, want, they don't want to... Uh, they, they don't they don't follow logic you know they want to be stupid i sometimes think yeah it's really sad so i mean uh, this article though i just got to say the guy this christian stucker did is he thinking that merkel and the uh regular dems in your uh government are you know are going to be okay with moving forward with a complete fossil free germany because he makes it sound like it's only the far right and that's opposed to this and that. i did not i did not talk to christian stoecker of course and well, i don't know his uh, his further going opinions on this uh but coming back to your question it's it is ridiculous to expect anything from the parties here this is why i joined the satire party <laughs> all right well i mean that's right? what it sounded like in the quote that he was saying you know the problem isn't the democrats the problem is the afd and trump and no the problem the problem the problem now here is that everybody understands the problem and every everybody tries to support the students you know but it's only half-hearted you know they, right. they see there is a topic which we where we can get votes from you know and we got to present ourselves as best as we can to do something against the climate catastrophe like nancy but they p aren't. yeah like nancy p like Nancy P for Medicare for all and all the other stuff in the U.S. Okay. It's a, it is the same tactics. And we, we got to be aware. We got to be aware of about what is what is going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, yeah, some some to close with some very nice uh, impressions from the uh, Friday for Futures demonstration around the world. In Rome, there was Greta and she had a big audience. Twenty five uh, twenty five thousand people were there. And uh, yeah, it was, as I said, it was global. You know, we got another slide with, uh, with impressions from Hong Kong, from, uh, from Sydney, South Africa, and India, you know. All the students, all the kids around the world, you know, they know what's going on, you know. And, and politicians still are trying, yeah, are trying to betray us. And we, can, we, we cannot let them do this. We got to fight back. And this, and this in the end brings me back to Extension Rebellion. Because it is so, I think it, I joined this group. John has said it before, and I in Düsseldorf. I, we got a we got a nice team there. I think we are still uh, around 20, 25 people. I guess I met them for the first time in the past weekend, and uh, it is it is in my opinion it is, it is so important, you know, to to show colors, you know, to be uh, to be uh, um, uh, to uh, to act according to the laws, you know, because anything else would discredit the movement right now. We will see if it helps. I have my doubts, but I think it is better than doing nothing or to give up. You know, join if you have if you have a group. Join your local Extinction Rebellion group. Meet the people. Those people are as desperate as you are. You know, and we all have only good intentions. You know, there is no violence involved. We don't we don't want any any violence. You know, we are trying this on the peaceful way, uh, and uh, this is, in my opinion, the only way. You know, to get to get attention from the people. Agreed. I'm, I'm kind of right there with you. I just can't go get arrested. But I'll, I'll do everything else. Marcus yeah, is yeah. going to get arrested. Show everybody your tat, your new tattoo. Ah, yes, my new tat. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it fits to the topic, to be honest. It does. Where is it? Here is it. <laughs> Hold on. I got it. There you go. I, now you had it. There you go. New tattoo from Alex in Dusseldorf. Yeah. Read what it says. Rise, Rise. rebel, resist. So it marks rise, says rebel, or resist, and this is exactly what we have to do. You know, we got to rise and we got to rebel against the system because we got we got to be aware. You know, the 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 uh, the real enemy is not politicians or what they are not doing. The real enemy is the system. It's a capitalistic system because the capitalist system would prevent every every effort to to change something which goes really deep. 
no, that that be also aware about this. I think that's what the, the Guardian article said as well, right? Our system yes. is fucked and we need to change it. It can't be based on sh on resource, on goods, on having stuff and, and wealth. It has to be, you know, planet exactly. first. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. That was great. Thank Looks you. like no, even though we cut this down to one story each, we're having a better discussion on it. And it's still going to take us an hour and a half to get through the fucking show. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Hey, Laura. Yes. So who wants? All right. So we didn't even talk about this. We got last week and upcoming. Are you doing those? Yes. Uh, you do last week because right. I wasn't on the shows. And I'll do the and I'll. All right. Uh, about David, actually. Sounds cool. Well, then here. Talk about last week. So. Uh, last week, no, that's this week. Yeah, it's upcoming. Hang on, pink. National popular vote passes in Oregon. So it passed the Senate. It's passed the House a gazillion times. Um, uh, it should get signed by uh, our governor, Kate Brown. What does it mean? It means that Oregon is part of the national popular vote. Uh, Larry talked about this last week. Uh, that still doesn't mean anything until we get a bunch of other states on it. We need to get 270 uh, of the electoral votes together in this national popular vote, and they basically uh, will be eradicate the electoral college because they'll just push their uh, votes to the, the, the popular person, like it should be. The electoral college should be gone fucking anyway. So that's, that's what this is about. We're glad Oregon finally did this. The more important thing about this is that um, the two people that have been blocking all the progressive legislation in Oregon Senate are now uh, facing the music. And somebody's forcing them to open stuff up. And hopefully Peter Courtney will resign or fall off a cliff. And Ginny Burdick will do the same. And uh, because they don't want to be pressured anymore to actually do their jobs. Uh, thank you. Babbitt's mom. B uh, sorry. Babbitt so yeah. got it ophelia it's ophelia she's a new oh, hey. follow, she's a yeah. new follower on twitter and thank you ophelia right. and thank yeah, you so much you, you can always come back and catch the end of the show live this is the same link to the archive yeah i don't even have my my um i don't even have my spiffy stuff up here where did i just show it no it didn't show hang on i can't do it yet I, I could put your, your quote up there on the screen, but it's not coming up in my scroll yet. I was going to show you. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for your donation. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. We are still doing things, and live streaming does still cost us money. Uh, we're having to invest in the solo uh, IPs, which is going to cost us an extra 500 bucks. And we are planning on covering um, live events. Uh, so uh, every every dime you give to us uh, basically goes to those overhead costs. No one at Uphill Media is taking a big fat salary of anything. Mm -hmm. It's all a bunch of zeros. So thank you. Thank you again. Jim Actually, Lockett. I'd like to shout out to uh, we, I just was reading email while we were on here and we just got a two hundred and fifty dollar donation from uh, from a viewer. Wow. I Holy think that's shit. the biggest one I've seen come through on our um Thank you. Action Network donation. So, yay. Her name is Lisa. Thank you. I don't know if she wants her full name mentioned on the air. But, Lisa, if you're watching, thank you. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, wow. Appreciate it. Thank you big time. And thank you, Jim Lockett, for another 10 bucks. Thank you, Jim. That. Jim it says, I'm sick of the rat race. I'm very technical. I figured that I could design a little off-grid camper. Nope, I can't generate enough uh, electricity to power a 100 square foot with solar. I'll tell you this. It's a hell of a lot more expensive than everybody talks about to actually set it up, to actually get the right pieces together and to generate real power, useful power through solar. It's still too expensive. It, it should be something that's just covered by the Pentagon, who lost $21 trillion, honestly. <laughs> but um, yeah, Jim, I'm with you there. I've been trying to do something similar, and, and it's, it's tough. It's tougher than you think. I, I, I agree with you. So thank you on that. Um, what else was last week? John, no. uh, may, may I quickly interrupt you? Yeah, of course. Because I want to wish our audience and you guys happy Eastern. Because I'm going to uh, leave. I'm leaving now for the oh, meeting yeah. with XR. There you go. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Have fun bye with bye. the rebellion. Have a good one. <laughs> See you. <laughs> Have fun storming the castle. Yeah. Bye-bye. Well, <laughs> it's the Princess Bride. I should remember that. <laughs> I made Marcus watch that movie for the first time. He had not seen really? that movie. Oh, that's a classic. Yeah. Yeah, they had not seen that movie. They they suffered through it, honestly. He was <laughs> Both him and Dennis Kissing were like parts and everything. <laughs> yeah, they were basically like uh what's his name? The kids. Oh, it's the kissing. Do we have to watch the kissing? 
Yeah. I just dropped our donate button in chat just in case anybody knows. We don't have a donate button on our YouTube. We have it on our website. So here it is again for oh, posterity. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. But that's sweet. That we, so people are, are, are watching and giving and value what we do. So that makes us feel good. It does. It does. I appreciate it. Yeah, really. I mean, this is really nice to see the, the viewers here. And I just want to thank Amos and Laura and Marcus uh, for putting up with my uh, mental instabilities and depression and, and waiting around for me to, you know, figure out what the fuck. And Laura knows she's been through this a number of times. Yeah, this is <laughs> I, this. Actually, I'm coming up on my three year anniversary of volunteering for Uphill Media. We started. I've with... been through this. I've been through this before. I know you'd never leave us. So. Nah, I trust that. Not this way. Not this way. Uh, uh, we started with a show called The Slide Show. Yeah. No, we started before that. You and I were covering the, we started with the People's, the, the People's Conference. Was that before the Slide June Show? June of 2016. Wow. That was, and, then, and then we covered the uh, conventions together. And then The Slide Show was what we, came, what, what we came out of after the conventions leading up to 2018. Wow. The slideshow and then awake. Yeah. The same Saturday show, we just keep changing the format. <laughs> Basically what it is. Yeah. All right. So uh we also did last week every every Sunday we'll put out a Bernie update with Larry Taylor. And this was uh there's nothing special about it other than read the description, but Larry gives a very short, it's on less than five minutes. Just what's going on in Oregon with uh, Bernie movement. I mean, Bernie doesn't even have any plans to be anywhere around here anytime soon. And we've already had major events, fundraising events for him. This, this, he, Bernie took uh, like 35 out of 36 counties in Oregon last time. And we just want to make sure that happens again. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, we got a lot going on here for that. And all right. Upcoming shows. Bust it out. Yours is first. Oh, what is mine? Yeah, but you're on Tomorrow's. camera. Sunday oh. show. Here. <laughs> I can't. Sunday show. Hang on. Uh, I gotta fix my thing. Here. So this is just the Sunday show. This is tomorrow. So uh, uh, democratizing the Democratic Party. So this ties in really well with what Laura Livengood was talking about with Don Ford. Okay. Uh, and, and that has to do. Why is it? Hang on. I made a mess with my camera shot somehow. There we go. <laughs> so Larry Taylor was a registered parliamentarian, which actually means something. It means that he's done a lot of fucking reading of a lot of really boring books, Robert's Rules of Order and understanding of bylaws and how they function and how you can use Robert's Rules in meetings. The National Convention is a large meeting run by Robert's Rules, just like the state level conventions, right? And Larry's been doing a lot of work on understanding what we have power to control if we get our shit together at these conventions. So he's going to be talking about the bylaws of the National Democratic Party, and that structurally affects everything. So we can, if we have a coalition, if we get enough people involved, enough progressives together and work our shit, we could make motions the first day of the convention and we could attempt change. Now, even if we don't make the change, it's kind of like the Mike Gravel campaign. His job there is to push things left, right? And if we show up first day with motions and we have our shit down and we've got support and we've got parliamentarians ready to shut shit down when they try to break the rules, then we show the DNC that we're not there to fuck around anymore. We know what we're doing. We've got some power. We've got some strategy. And it's, that's, to me, that's, that's important in this war, right? This is like the next level. XP, level up, do this stuff. So uh, Larry's going to talk about that. I'm interested to, like, I'm going to take the slides from what Laura talked about and Don Ford and talk to Larry about this and see what he has to say about it. Um, I, and I'd love to get the two of them on to talk. So that's tomorrow, 10 a.m. And then, of course, there'll be a Bernie update on that. And uh, then, yeah, it's you, Laura. So, yes. Now we're at this. I'm all muted. Good. Not. Um, yes. We the people 2020. We've got David Hildebrand coming back to visit us on Wednesday, April 24th. Uh, as you may recall, he ran uh, against Diane Feinstein, for, uh, California senator. Uh, he did. He did not win, but he has been busy, busy, busy ever since working for um, other North State uh, campaigns. He's a 
He works in Sacramento. And he's running to uh, represent Northern California on the Progressive Caucus. So he's running for Northern Vice Chair of the Progressive Caucus. He's going to come and tell us what the heck that is and uh, also give his perspectives, of which are always very insightful, on uh, the state of the race so far. And we're looking forward to talking to him. Awesome. 7, 7 p.m. PT, Wednesday, April 24th. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to David. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that'll be cool. Very cool. Thank you. All right. The last thing we have, and then we're getting out of here with uh, this beautiful thing by AOC and The Intercept. And I forget who else was involved. Just a couple short science notes. We're here with the Planet of the Apes. Scientists added human brain genes to monkeys, yet it's as scary as it sounds. And if you read this article, it really is as scary as it sounds. And China has been doing these kind of things for a while. And yes, they have implanted genes that, yes, have done some improvements on monkey brains. And now we've created a group of genetically modified monkeys, and they got a whole bunch of them, right? It's, this, is, this is nuts. And researchers from our country go over to China and wherever else they're doing this shit and buy monkeys for a lot less because apparently they're like six grand in the US to experiment on, like 1,500 over there to experiment on. So they buy them and they make these genetically modified animals. Now, ethics aside, pretty cool. But when you add the ethics back in, you're like, holy shit. <laughs> you know, I. I have no problem wanting to play God or be gods, but man, we are so not there. We're like a three-year-old playing with fire, you know? We can't even save ourselves from extinction, and here we are trying to make new species. And one, and the, the, the main thing that the person said in this diet that really hit me was, okay, so you make a smarter monkey. And understand these are monkeys. These are not apes. So this, this is before the big split. What they're trying to do is recreate the spark that went to the apes and then we diverged from that okay so they're they're back down here they're not trying to actually make planet of the apes they're trying to make monkeys more like apes right trying to bridge that gap right but that doesn't whatever you you know they've been doing this with other things <laughs> they've been making glow in the fish that that glow in the dark with different colors they've been making beagles that look like arnold fucking Schwarzen beagle and now we've got monkeys that are smarter and uh uh, the question that one doctor had to say was, what, what purpose does this animal have? So you give it higher intelligence, and now it's like, and I think, so who did that to us? Because <laughs> that's exactly where we're at. Somebody dropped some fucking genes in us, and we're like, uh, I'm a hairless ape. What am I fucking doing here? It's my point. Uh, that's exactly what we are. <laughs> just, just want to lay that down. All right. So it's been happened. It's happened to us, and now we're doing it to other creatures. It's, it's, yeah. My favorite story, though, has to do with homelessness. And this is on the streets of San Francisco. There's a lot of shit, apparently. This is uh, this is a true story. So people are pooping more than ever on the streets of San Francisco because the wealthy people in San Francisco don't give a shit about their homeless. And that's a chart. Now, <laughs> I love this. Human feces incidents. I'm guessing an incident is a word for pile of shit, right? <laughs> it's an incident. I like that job. Yeah. <laughs> Collecting that data. Now, 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 these are only documented incidents. <laughs> And the mayor said, there's likely much more undocumented incidents. But the high number here in 2018 is more than 28,000 incidents. <laughs> 28,000 piles of shit on the streets of San Francisco in 2018 alone. And that's documented. Don't you think it would be just better for them to fucking house their homeless and uh, do something about rental pricing and stop these pretentious motherfuckers from gentrifying the shit out of places? Or you can live in your high rise and look down on a street full of shit, I guess, is what they're doing. Thank you, Pat Hacker, for your $5. Testing to see if Super Chat goes through. Not able to do them on door. You can't hear. 
And we're going to be here for door and we'll tell Jimmy. <laughs> That'd be great. No. Um, we'll make sure he gets them. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure. <laughs> we'll we have a crack sure. accounting yeah. team. Yeah. Uh, they acknowledge that they have a homeless problem, but apparently they don't want to do anything about it. They actually have a poop patrol. They have paid public servants to go around cleaning up the poop on the streets instead of just dealing with their fucking... That's how we deal with things in America. We deal with symptoms, not causes, right? right. Oh, climate change. And I have a link to a, 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 an Al Jazeera article in, my, in the, the notes that talks about... That this is a great example of this, where... You know, uh, the oceans are, are warming, glaciers are melting. It's new information since the IPCC report. And instead of telling you that the fossil fuel industry is the main cause and that these hundred industries need to die, we're going to tell you the five things you can do at home to help stop climate change. Because eating less meat is, of course, the first thing that's going to do it. Yeah. It's half measures. It's addressing symptoms. I'm not saying we shouldn't eat less meat. I'm not saying we shouldn't do something different with the way we eat animals around here. But let's address the actual problem first, right? The poop in the streets has to deal with homelessness, not because people prefer to poop in, in public, right? <laughs> that's, that's, but my guess is they'll start installing fucking public toilets everywhere. That's, that's what they'll do. Anyway, music story time, folks. By the way, is the collection of this information called Scatology? <laughs> Scatology. Nice. Could I don't know. That could be. What's the scoop? We could we could have so much fun poop jokes with that. How many of you haven't seen the amazing um, uh, piece by uh, the Intercept and AOC? You haven't seen it. You saw it. You haven't seen it. Oh shit. Amos, you saw it? No, I haven't. Oh, gosh. Have you guys seen this? This is amazing. So this is uh, The Intercept got together with um, AOC and I want to say Naomi Klein and a few other people and just this beautiful, artistic, wonderful explanation of what future we could have if we elect more AOCs and get rid of the Bidens. Right? The, the cover card, everybody, remember... This guy thinks millennials are stupid, right? And he wants to run for president. And he's not going to do shit about climate change either, right? Just remember that. So we're going to get out of here with this beautiful piece. Amos, Laura, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for doing the hard work thank it takes. You. You're so welcome. You're all guys. <laughs> yeah. And uh, go do something in your area for climate Seriously. Oh, by the way, what are you guys, any ideas for uh, Earth Day? Well, it coincides really nicely with Weed Day uh, weekend. It's, lo it's uh, my partner's birthday, so we're going to be celebrating. I don't know. Which, Which day is Earth Day? Monday. Monday. Right? This is our Earth Day show. It's our Earth Day show, I guess. Yeah. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Mm -hmm. Scatology is a real science, apparently, says Pat Hacker. Mm -hmm. Because hunters can tell about what's in the shit and creatures and stuff, right? You've seen that with the survival dudes. Yeah. What did they eat? Yes. What did... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm glad we brought it back to poop for the ending. <laughs> it's so good. Ah, when is Earth Day? It is the 22nd. It's the 22nd. And it's special for me because I was born that year. My partner was born on that day in that year. And uh, I made a video that kind of talks about that shit. Uh, but that's that's out there to look at. Um, I gotta frame this. It's not framed right. This is just such a beautiful thing. I, I love when media, when web media kind of excels beyond mm. old traditional media. You're like you couldn't do this with a fucking newspaper, you know. So. Oh, I did see this. I just hadn't watched all the way through. Oh, so, all right. so glad. So here we go. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. For the Lair the Portland show and uh, Amos. See you. Oh. See you Wednesday for David Hildebrand. Yeah. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Pacific. Bye, everybody. Bye. Let's do this. There we go. Ah, the bullet train from New York to D.C. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. 
In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. 
Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stop being so scared of the future. We stop being scared of each other. And we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too. And in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see.